it's time for another video from Mr. Probably Pretentious. The problem with anime fans. Very clickable title. He definitely uh, games the YouTube, you know, meta pretty damn well. Let's see what he has to say. If there's one thing the entire anime industry is built upon, it's compromise. And if there's one thing that fuels mainstream anime discourse, it's unreasonable expectations. And as you'd expect, those two things go together like peanut butter and a gallon of battery acid. Unreasonable expectations and compromise. Yeah. Executive business suits, sponsors, production committees, forcing down impossible schedules and content, expecting out of animators who don't get paid anything, the average person making money off of Blue Lock animation, $32 USD per month. Yeah, that sounds about right. Unrealistic expectations plague every form of media ever, but if we zero in on anime or more specifically production values of anime, we see an interesting phenomena. Over the past half a decade, give or take, the casual fans' awareness of animation quality has gone up. Mm. It's like they gain sentience for the first time, it's like their third eye opened and they realize there's more to an anime than the writing. And that's a good thing. Yeah, I think that, um... It's probably younger generations and more people just continuously watching anime rather than being a first-time watcher and not really thinking beyond just the writing and what they see on screen right now. They're thinking about the production value. Myself included, I never really cared about production value until I got hit with so much shitty CGI and just massively produced min-maxed, you know, isekais that are just so garbage but has good, you know, potentially sourced material. Now I'm starting to realize that, yeah, I can tell quality usually now a little bit better that I can tell when there's quality versus when it's just, you know, it's, it's like a failure frame situation. Exactly. Thing. Sure, this increased awareness has led to a plethora of mind-numbingly moronic takes being plastered. Boruto constantly gets shit on for this one scene. Maybe it's not the same scene, but it's the scene where Boruto is like crying. This is such a memed on uh, event. Like, I, I don't know exactly what happened, but I always see the same shit leading to Boruto just crying. ...takes being plastered all over the internet and to unsavory behavior such as fans, fans harassing staff members online. But at the same time, this awareness has allowed the casual fan to explore yet another dimension of anime, leading mm. to an increase in appreciation for both the artists involved with the medium and the art form itself, and also the studio for some reason. Anyway, long story short, I'm starting to recognize more like freelance art like names, right? Studios, I mean, given the nature of this industry and how much, you know, content is produced by elite uh, freelance workers, they're basically like S rank mercenary guild, you know, adventurers. And they kind of want to help out other friends and rivals who are of the same caliber. And, you know, that's why they move from projects to projects kind of together. Like, that's why MAPPA, Jujutsu Kaisen season two, that's why people went there to work, even though they knew it was MAPPA. Because the lead director, I think, was like a guy who was like a legend, and other people also wanted to kind of help them out. But this increased awareness has its pros and cons, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. I can't, in good conscience, tell you what you should and shouldn't pay attention to while watching anime. That's entirely your business, but this awareness and appreciation lead to expectations. And since... I would also argue that this awareness and expectations, just like opening their third eye, becoming sentient of anime beyond with a story, is making his channel do way better too, right? Because this guy really does know what he's talking about, I think. As a complete amateur, just, just a monkey watching anime and having fun, you seem to know like a lot more about production value and obviously having that insight and detail, right? He can obviously grow way more because it's, it's educational. Most people aren't exactly aware of the inner workings of the anime industry. These expectations are often entirely unreasonable with no basis in reality. It took us a while, but that, that's what this video is about. Okay. Expectations. We all have them and they often lead to disappointment. You expect a show. That's right, brother. You never want to be disappointed in your life. Never have any expectation. Then you can't be disappointed. But that's such a sad way to live, right? That's like giving up on any dreams or goals and hopes because you don't want to experience failure. It's just always... You should expect. You should expect greatness. You should expect for the best. But always prepare and anticipate for the worst.
to look good and I cannot sit here and pretend like that's not normal. Everybody does that, especially if the show in question is an adaptation of a source material you are fond of. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly normal. I myself have been disappointed countless times by anime and their production value or lack thereof. The Angel Next Door spoils me rotten, berserk of gluttony to name a few. Wanting an Angel spoils me rotten was that bad? I did watch it, but that was such a long time ago where I didn't really give a fuck about production value, I guess. All I could feel was the diabetes induced by just the gushy gushy lovey lovey. Was it poorly animated? Anime to look good is perfectly normal. That's not what this video is about. I'm not asking you to shut up and accept a substandard product. I don't do that, so why should you? It's entirely within your rights to expect an anime to look good. The problem, however, is that most people are clueless as to what a good looking anime is. Okay. They are unable to distinct. Most people are clueless on what good anime is. But good is so subjective. There must be a set of parameters and things that we can gauge quantitatively, scientifically, to say, like, this is good, this is bad. And I, at the end of the day, if you watch something and you really had fun, I think that's what mattered, right? It's just the overall feeling and vibe you got. Now, what you may have watched might be complete dog shit to him, right? So let's try to understand what is a good anime? between good looking and literally the highest level of quality TV anime has ever seen. People hold shows, especially popular ones, to unfathomably high standards and yeah. that is what this video is about. And I think that's totally fair, right? The standard that's expected from a source material that's been highly praised, there's nothing wrong with having those high expectations and standards. In fact, you should have it. Why not? You should demand the best as a consumer. If you're fine with mediocrity and you just, you know, suck it up, then it's pointless and the studios will be like, ha, huh, looks like we can get away with it, right? But at the same time, you shouldn't be just tilted and just screeching like a monkey on Twitter when your favorite show that had such high expectations flops due to events that happens behind the scenes that could have caused the shitty adaptation. So... Just being aware, right? Being aware of like how this shit works will probably make you realize why is my anime so good or bad? Shows like Jujutsu Kaisen, Mob Psycho, Chainsaw Man, etc. aren't simply good looking. They are literal benchmarks of quality. They are generational works of art. You cannot expect that level from generic shonen adaptation True. 101. You just can't. That or even just the plethora of generic isekais that gets pumped out like they're not gonna have quality right it's just it is what it is we should expect better but it's also an unreasonable expectation if you kind of think on a realistic basis of how the industry you know works and all the compromises like he said in the beginning how the compromises are already there like people are just getting milk dry and there's not enough infrastructure and resources to really cater time and scheduling to these projects it's it's just Conflict of interest whenever you're trying to make money and create art. That part should be obvious. It's like expecting every restaurant you visit to serve three Michelin star meals. It just, it doesn't make sense. So Yeah, that's fair. But when I go to Burger King or some, you know, McDonald's or some, you know, fast food chain, I know what I'm signing up for, but it better taste that good. Because sometimes, even if I know what I'm signing up for, it's just cheap fast food. It's like, there's quality differences, man. Have you ever went to a McDonald's and you had fries or burgers, but like the fries are so stale and old because it's been out there for three fucking hours. And then the next person that orders gets a new fresh batch and it tastes so much better. I'm not sure if this example really holds, but I'm trying to explain to you that even if we're in the realm of shitty junk food, there is a spectrum of what is good and what is bad. And I feel like a lot of these shitty junk food, which then gets mirrored onto shitty isekais that we see so much. Some of them just don't even hit the way that I'm expecting it to. And if I'm fully aware of what I'm signing up for. It just, it doesn't make sense. So then, what is a good looking anime? Well, it's a show with a distinct visual identity and the ability to execute that look. Of course, that doesn't mean every show must look as unique as, say, Ping Pong the Animation. But Whoa. shows should preferably have a distinct look and everything that constitutes that look should be executed well. That's all there is to a... 
Have a distinct look and execute well. Uh, okay. Good looking anime. Everything else is extra. Shows like JJK, Mob, etc. are outliers. Alright, sure. You don't expect that level of quality from a show. But why is expecting constant action animation in an action anime considered unreasonable? Why is the go-to method of animating dialogue the mouth flap? Why should the... <laughs> Spirit Chronicles. Spirit Chronicles catching strays. Animating dialogue, the mouth flap. Why yeah. should the bare minimum be considered satisfactory? Why is that the baseline? Am I not the one who said production value matters even more than the story? Am I not being a hypocrite? Well, to answer that, we need to talk about the anime industry. Yeah, um, I don't think it's really about being a hypocrite or like these standards. I still think that you should expect the best. But it's all about understanding what exists, what is real, what is our current industry, and what can they realistically pump out. And of course, you can have high expectations and high standards and hope for always better things. But you also have to realize what is reality and that expecting these things is usually going to lead to disappointment because it's impossible, right? Due to the way that things are structured, it's impossible. In an ideal world, the world isn't ideal, right? Theoretically, everything could be just fucking perfect. Everything could have enough money poured into it with immense talent and have scheduling to pump out just art. But that's just not practical or realistic in the world that we live in. And once we accept that fact, then what he's saying makes sense to me. So just be aware that like there's nothing wrong with having high standards, but also you have to face reality and understand what the hell is actually happening around you as a whole and once we are done a lot of animation related happenings will start to make sense recent or not of course this is a topic i've covered in detail multiple times before this is an abbreviated version in the modern world an average anime doesn't look average it looks mediocre i know that sounds like a paradox but it's true average is better than mediocre what is mediocre by the way i, I always thought it was the same thing it's just mid, okay. Moderate quality, not very good. Okay, moderate, not very good. An average can really... An average is different. Because average is relative to the amount of things that you're gauging, right? Because like... Mediocre sounds more like the median. Where the average can be skewed to either ends of the spectrum depending on how many more good things there are or how many more bad things there are. You know what I mean? Like an average is not like the halfway point. The average is a summation of everything involved and dividing it by the, quant the amount. Mediocre is more like a, st like a fixed point of just meh, just mid. Average can be really fucking good relative to the mid. Average could also be really bad compared to the mid. That makes sense to me. The balance between good and bad looking anime is practically non-existent. The number of intermediate, good but not great looking shows has gone down significantly and as a result, the average quality of the medium has mm. deteriorated. Trust there it is. me, I know. I watch upwards of 25 shows every season. Only 25 bro? Yo, this guy's watching as much as we do. <laughs> and he's doing it because he wants to? I mean, I kind of want it too, but like, it's more of I'm making content, so we're checking it out. But damn, bro. You're watching that many too? And yeah, I can tell. There, there is so much garbage. There is so much garbage. There are definitely diamonds in the rough. But uh, there's a lot of slop around, man. Reason, if anyone scrapes the bottom of the barrel, it's me. Too many shows leading to less time being allotted for each project, leading to staff being stretched thin, leading mm -hmm. to the industry relying more on inexperienced talent and convenient alternatives to raw skill. You get the idea. Yep. Ultimately, all of this leads to an industry-wide decrease in drawing quality and layout complexity, and an all-around increase in the number of anatomical errors and perspective issues popping up exactly right if you have a limited amount of resources and animators working on this shit but you keep increasing the volume of demands of course things are going to get spread thin you have more to do but the same to work with it just doesn't scale just in general it's a mess like i said near the start the entire industry is built upon compromise and corner cutting damn near every single anime you watch fights a long uphill battle before making it to your screen anime starts with a vision an audiovisual idea that belongs either to one person or a small group of people this vision then goes through a large number of steps production pipelines and people and 
and ultimately only a fraction of this vision makes it to the final product and that's an optimistic number it's not uncommon for the directorial vision to be lost entirely the less time a production has the more it needs to be fragmented you have the series director he is the creative lead he's the guy with the idea he is okay. the guy with the vision but he doesn't direct everything himself episode directors and storyboard artists handle direction and shot compositions at an episodic or sectional level then comes the animation and of course the directors cannot draw every single frame themselves there's a lot happening right now but basically structure you have a main director with the vision then you have other sub directors that works on different components because the main guy can't handle everything so we have animators but that alone obviously doesn't get the job done so we divide animators into key animators and in between animators hmm. key animators draw the pivotal frames and in between animators that's right i remember this the key animator is like this is like the most important meat and bones and then the supporting animators i guess then takes what the key animator made and then kind of like connects the dots right just fill in the blanks but that isn't enough either key animators usually don't have the time to clean up their own work so they are further divided into layout animators and second key animators Jesus. the latter handle the clean up because of this the original artistic nuances of the animator are often lost still yeah this is so many different this too many cooks in the kitchen like division the creative art directing it gets lost in the sauce if you have like seven separate chains of command of them just working it's like a endless game of uh fucking it's, it's, it's a telephone game where you know i say something and i say i relay what i said to the next person the next person relays what i said to the next person five iterations down the road it's gonna be totally different well, if there are so many animators involved with an episode how come the final product manages to look somewhat consistent yeah well, enter animation directors or ad's for short an ad corrects the animation maintaining visual cohesion i see you have all these different chains of command working on sub components sub components sub -comp components and then you at the very end it all gets br brought together by this ad the last guy who then just makes sure that the vision that the project had is consistent and everything is seamless. And fixing errors, but the lack of time meant that a single AD couldn't correct an entire work, so multiple ADs were needed, and so was the supervisory chief animation director or CAD. But with time, it's not enough. Every one of these roles has three sub roles. Holy shit. Or without it, rather, multiple CADs were. Why don't schools teach this to us? It's so interesting. Bro, your school don't even teach you how to pay taxes. Your school doesn't even teach you financial literacy. How to pay taxes, what a mortgage is, how to fucking get a job and maintain your finances. Do you think they're going to tell you about this shit? Nah, they're gonna tell you the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell for the fucking 17th time. Required further fragmenting the animation process and all of that, all of it, only concerns the animation. You have other departments, color, background, photography, etc. and they face their own challenges. You get the idea, right? The production- There's a lot of different things happening here, but I think the key takeaway is that there's a lot of dudes involved in these projects. And for every single role, there seems to be multiple sub roles to kind of like manage everything together because it's just too much for one person. The process is heavily fragmented and that's not for the most part a creative choice. Just because an animator drew a rough but moving cut for the second season of Blue Lock doesn't mean the rest of the team can just trace it and color it in. The layout still needs to go through multiple steps and if those departments don't have the time, the final product will suffer. Imagine this, what if a project actually had the time and talent it needed? Imagine mm. if a director was able to direct and board the entire project, animate half of it himself, and trust the remaining half to a group of small but extremely talented animators, okay. thus eliminating the need for external supervision, and develop a model of second key animation and in betweening that preserves the original artistic intent. This sounds too good to be true. Sounds like Madhouse walk working on free run. Well, you don't have to imagine anything. I just described look back. That's literally how the movie was produced. Okay. Director Kiyotaka Oshiyama did all of those things. And the difference between look back and any heavily fragmented project is night and day. Of course, a project being fragmented isn't necessarily bad in theory. For example, animators might want their friends to pitch in, but usually this is done to deal with tight deadlines and is yeah, this again is too many cooks in the kitchen, right? I think it's 
always best to have one single person that has the vision, the creative artistic vision that's proven himself in the industry or themselves in the industry to lead the project. But with time constraints, it's an industry built on compromise. So inevitably, it's just going to get fragmented, fragmented until it kind of loses that key, like, soul the vision that the main person had but then it gets brought back in and you know gets pieced together but i can start to see more and more why like everything is the way it is there's so many moving parts on this wheel right now and i'm surprised the wheel hasn't even fucking fallen off isn't conducive to creativity of course the lack of talent is a major issue as well this is another topic i've covered in the past very briefly a show might lack talent just in general or for specific roles an action anime for example might lack action animators just look at hell's paradise all of these factors i didn't even realize how bad hell's paradise was until he kept shitting on it because back then that was still like a year or while ago where i was just watching anime and like all right cool and i guess it's interesting the Animation, was it that bad? I have to go back and really analyze those frames for myself now, but... Huh. So many things. I'm also becoming sentient. My third eye is slowly opening. ...and more have a role to play in the declining visual quality associated with modern anime. And they are also the reason why us, the fans, need to keep our expectations in check lest we ever think for being disappointed. Mm, this is more like a philosophical thing. I still think that you should always expect the best, but... The check part is, hope for the best, but expect the worst. Now, that sounds kind of hypocritical. I just said expectations should be high. The different way to frame this again is hoping there's nothing wrong with it. Having standards, having hope, expecting something good should be good. But in order to protect yourself, you should expect the worst. You, you should <laughs> anticipate and expect the worst, but hope for something amazing. But why don't we? Like I said, anime usually looks mediocre. But still, why is it that we continue to expect so much from certain titles? Um, the source material? Sometimes there are diamonds in the rough like Oshinoko or Freerin that just comes out and just surprises everybody. Dandanan as well, right? Source material sometimes then also you, you, it generates that hype of like, oh shit, Chainsaw Man's coming out. Oh my god, this is going to be so amazing, right? Or Sakamoto Days, it's going to come out, right? So big manga titles or existing IPs that people are really looking forward to. Of course, they're going to have their you know expectations so high. Do fans not see the current state of the industry or are they simply delusional? Well, yeah. I don't think most people understand the state of the industry though, right? They're just watching anime, right? I don't think the average person watches videos like this. I think this is very educational and informational as I understand more of the perspectives of the industry from the eyes of different people, right? Until recently, I didn't even realize, you know, the uh, really reality, the situations that's happening in Japan with all these different production committees and studios and, you know, freelance workers and so on. So I, I think that the average person, again, just thinks that anime just created out of nowhere, just comes out of a black box. And sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. Yes, but in general, fans anchor their expectations onto certain factors, and not all of them are entirely unreasonable. Let's go through them. Popularity of the IP is yep. a significant factor. A major, widely read source material will obviously have a larger fan base and yep. therefore have a larger percentage of casual fans. And like I said, these fans and their newfound awareness of production values will want their favorite IP to look as good as humanly possible. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? I think that's totally fine for average and new, new people watching. You know, there's something so popular, something that honestly, even like intuitively, just think about this. Does it make sense logically that if something is so popular, the manga, the light novel, whatever, that the anime should also be really good? Because don't you think that because of the popularity, you already have such a big audience pool that you can, you know, generate a lot of money from if you create good art? So wouldn't it be in the, you know, the, uh, the studio's best interest to make the best anime they could for these big titles. I think that's a reasonable assumption that you can make, even if you're not aware of the compromises and the reality that is the industry. Possible ...without any knowledge of or consideration for the behind-the-scenes circumstances. The upcoming Sakamoto Days anime is a perfect example of this. Yeah. I have no personal attachment to this series. I haven't read the manga. Neither have I, but all I hear is just hype, 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 and glaze. Just like Dandaran too. I didn't know shit about Dandaran. I just knew people were really talking about it. One thing I'm worried about talking about today is beyond just production, you know, value is the copyright because I, if it's the same copyright holders on youtube like blue box there's a chance that sakamoto days will be blocked for pretty much everybody so the reactions 
will just be dead. So I think I can be objective. The anime based on the trailers looks good. It has a strong, well-defined style, a few cool cuts of animation, and an yep. all-around fun look. Fans, however, are disappointed. Since Why? it is a shonen adaptation, they are mentally comparing it to Jujutsu Kaisen or other IPs of that nature. And like I said near the start, that is a stupid thing to do. Jujutsu Kaisen is an industry-wide conglomeration of talent led by an extremely influential anime producer. It yeah, this is the thing, right? Remember, the best of the best talent that exists are S-rank mercenaries, S-rank guild adventurers, okay? They want to party up with other highly coveted people. It's a game of loyalty, rivalry, respect, of talent that chases talent. And the boys are all coming together to make Jujutsu Kaisen. Probably not going to be the same case for Sakamoto Days. I don't think there's anything wrong with having expectations of, you know, again, expecting Sakamoto Days to be on JJK Caliber. But for the average audience watching shit, they don't understand how talent, you know, wants to work with other high talent. And that that was a generational moment of just art happening at the cost of, you know, a lot of people's mental health. You, you see how MAPPA works, people. It's probably not going to happen for Sakamoto Days. It is literally produced by the A-team at a studio as massive as MAPPA and every freelance animator known to man. You cannot expect that from literally anything else except for like Chainsaw Man, which was made by the same team. Will Sakamoto Days look good? Probably it's how- Yeah, it'll probably look good to the point where I can't even tell the difference honestly between how great JJK was. I, I still think that like my understanding of production value and art in general is so amateur that I probably couldn't tell the difference of like a 9 out of 10 and like an 8 out of 10. But I feel like at a certain level, I do recognize the difference in quality for shows that seems to actually give a fuck rather than most of these, you know, mass produced, just min-maxed shitty isekais that we see on a daily basis. Hard to tell based on the trailers, but I think it looks decent. You fans are being unreasonable. Now, yes, this approach isn't entirely stupid. Producers tend to prioritize. Yeah, yeah. Fans having these expectations is only stupid because you don't recognize what is real, what is reality itself of the compromises. But that doesn't mean that we should be fine and saying everything is fine in the industry. It's just when he says like, you're being unreasonable, not stupid. It's less about like victim blaming, but rather about this is the current situation of the industry. And it is what it is. Now, that doesn't mean, again, that the industry, the way it is, is a good thing. That's a totally separate conversation. ...popular IPs, and these days, they associate quality with popularity. So the probability of a popular anime adaptation looking good is high. But again, for the millionth time, Jujutsu Kaisen isn't simply good looking. It's not the baseline. It's not even the ceiling. It's the floor above. The not the baseline, not the thing, it's the floor above. The floor and the ceiling, you know. The, you know, bottom, top, right? It's a range of how good things could be. But bro fucking... <laughs> kick that shit up to the next floor. That is the caliber of JJK Season 2. That's kind of crazy, man. That's, that's insane. Yeah. Again, just like a generational moment of the best talents all coming together under one person. Maybe not one person, but again, the amount of just quality quality talent that exists that attracts other talent it's not gonna happen for every popular show right rather than thinking this source material is popular therefore it should be good we should think more of who is working where at the moment right where are the best uh directors which which you know products are they working on and if you can like i guess have information on that then it's like okay then i know that because this director and this team is working it's probably gonna be good the previous season of a show might be a factor one punch man for example season one was one of the best looking shows ever and mm. comparatively season two was inferior different teams different products right completely separate teams right i think it was madhouse again that did one punch man maybe i'm wrong season one but just a team it's just like the avengers assembled but then season two was just left to jc staff which uh they did all right but it's not gonna be a season one moment right it's in comparison it's gonna look trash you gotta think about who are working on it right if you can understand who is working on these projects then it's a little bit more clear 
production circumstances the whole nine yards. Naturally, fans were disappointed and I can understand that to a degree. It's probably the most reasonable factor so far. If, say, Jujutsu Kaisen Season 3 were to suddenly look bad, I too would be disappointed. I get that. Okay. Uh, some additional info because recording got corrupted. Sequel season suffering a dip in quality is quite common. Yeah, we have, we've changed time after time of season 2, which is letting us down, right? It's because the first seasons are usually better planned, have more time when it compares to sequels. Producers basically go, you already have a fan base. You don't need to put people in with quality anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Once you... And, and the most important thing, right, is advertisement for the source material. Anime, at the end of the day, is an advertisement for you to go buy the manga, for you to go buy the light novels, right? Of course, DVD, Blu-ray search, you know, sales, Blu-ray, uh, merchant stuff is always welcome too. But once you have baited catfish people with the good experience through season one content, then they are more easily to just get away with the mid-adaptation because they're hoping that the name, the brand... The community, the fandom of those shows will carry these terrible season two content. We're kind of seeing that with Blue Lock, right? <laughs> and the sad thing is, I think they're doing well in terms of just numbers. It's just sad. I don't know how many people are enjoying it, but the hype is, the story is there and the production value is so bad, yet they're somehow getting away with the min max, which frustrates me. Because this may be more signals in the industry, but like, all right, we can get away with this shit. Let's keep fucking, you know, min-maxing this shit. It's like, oh, come on, man. Another factor fans love clinging to is the studio involved. Circling back to that Sakamoto Days example for a mm. second, fans started hating on the show even before they got their first glimpse at the anime because... Which studio was it? The studio got leaked and it wasn't one of those big boy names. But if you followed this channel for a while, you'd know that the studio name means very little. It yeah, I I don't know exactly how significant the studio names are in the grand scheme of things compared to, again, freelance talent that attract other freelance talent. Except for a few select companies like Ufotable, Kyoto Animation and mm. Trigger, studios are usually a mess of production lines with talent coming and going all the time. Mm. The studio that- Like those studios mentioned already has such a strong, strong employee employee relationship. So I guess there's less freelance. I'm not sure how that works, but Ufotable seems to always have a very consistent, this movie tier quality content pumping out. So. There's less of like freelance impacting the, I guess, the volatility of the, their quality. That made this also made this. The studio that made this also made this. You get mm. the idea. Yeah. Yes, the studio isn't entirely irrelevant. They usually have certain connections and access to certain talent via studio specific producers. And they might also be a part of the production committee and those factors can affect the quality of a show. But in the grand scheme of things, as far as the creative side is concerned, a studio is simply a building in which an anime is produced. Mm. A studio is simply a building where the anime is produced. Might be a little bit of an ex ex extreme example, but I get what he's saying, right? Don't think of a studio of, you know, they're capable of doing this, therefore they can do that. Think more about who are the freelance workers, part of these projects, independent of the studio, and then figure out why these animes look good or bad, even though it's from the same studio. That makes sense to me. Some fans, the more informed kind, anchor their expectations on the core staff. Their minds are capable of comprehending the fact that a building doesn't have arms and therefore can't draw. So they look at the talent involved instead and that is reasonable but not- Yes, a building doesn't have arms so the people inside must be the one responsible for it. <laughs> what is <laughs> not entirely reliable, it can be misleading. The recent Vistoria, for example, mm. was directed by Tatsuya Yoshihara, one of the best action directors of her time, but outside of the first episode, the show didn't really reflect that. One of the episodes was storyboarded by the one and only Itsuki Tsuchigami, but it didn't exactly look eye-catching, especially considering the fact that Tsuchigami in the past has been responsible for some of the best action episodes ever. Why is that? Because even if Tsuchigami storyboarded the most insane episode ever, who would animate it? You need a star-studded team to realize storyboards that ambitious. Damn. The storyboard guy is so good that 
there isn't talent that can actually animate his vision. That is a skill issue on a different fucking plane of existence. God damn. Also, Tsuchigami's episode belonged to the tail end of the production. There's no way they had the time to animate storyboards like that. Even Tsuchigami himself probably didn't have- Like, like this really is like a fucking guild system, man. Like raids. It's a party. There's different roles. They're not just all the same people. They're not just all animators, bro. There's a tank. There's a healer. There's frontline DPS. There's long range DPS. You know, there's all these different things. The storyboard person, right? You got all these different people that creates with the artistic vision. Then you have the people that needs to be able to then translate that vision into work. It's just like, and again, the, the, the system, this whole mercenary system, the raid party, it just, it makes sense. Soccer team. Yeah, it's a team. It's a team of different roles. They're not all the same role. There's many different specialized roles. And if you can't, you know, complete that team party, which is again just usually made of just freelance talent, it's not gonna work. At the time, to storyboard an episode of Mob 211 or JJK 216 caliber, and he knew that for that. Also, I thought that his story was really fucking good too, yes. But again, I'm not at a point where I can filter, like, this is splitting hairs where you are now. Like, this is like a, like the really good with story is maybe like a 9.5 out of 10, but then the relatively bad is more like 8.5 or 8.8. I, I can't distinguish that. I don't know what I'm looking for. Everything just looks good to me, you know, because I'm just an amateur. That reason, he decided to board a possible episode with decentish action instead. The availability of talent alone isn't enough. The availability of time alone isn't enough. And I know what you might be thinking. How am I supposed to keep up with all of these factors? Well, two-word answer, you're not. Simply expecting a show to look good is enough. And if an expectation that basic isn't met, it's entirely within your rights to be disappointed. Yeah. Holding shows to stupidly high standards benefits no one. It doesn't benefit the creators. It doesn't benefit the businessmen. Yeah, again, just be realistic with your expectations. By understanding the reality of the industry, you can now understand that it's okay. It's fine that compromise will happen and there's inevitably going to be mediocre products coming out for even your favorite source materials, right? It's totally fine to be disappointed, but if you have unrealistic expectations, that's not grounded in reality. It's only going to be negative for you. Behind the scenes and it doesn't benefit us, the fans. It's one of those rare instances where everybody loses. You know, it's fine if every single fight isn't a Sakuga fest, as long as a few of them are. And that just about does it. This All was right. a topic I wanted to cover for a while and I finally got around to it. I hope it was interesting. That's about This is a very educational content for me. Because again, I'm just the dumb anime reactor guy that just says bald when a bald guy's head's on screen. I didn't even know until recently that studios had less impact and it's more of freelance workers and the talent and how talent then attracts other talent works, right? This video truly kind of puts everything into picture of anime fans that are new and old, some of them becoming more sentient and understanding why production value is the way it is and some pe new people that just expects that their popular show should be good no matter what right and by understanding that this industry is built around compromise and that it's impossible to have every show be that good because the lack of talent again in this whole mercenary system and people you know having loyalty and respect and uh, you know talent attracting other talent right that kind of then really paints a picture of why some shows are really good and why some shows are really bad, despite them both being from the main, in the same studio. So I think the main takeaway of this is at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with wanting your favorite show or your favorite new source material getting adaptation to be good. But those expectations can lead to disappointment, which is the case for anything in life. I still think that you should always still, you know, expect the best, but prepare for the worst. And that is, again, keeping your expectations in check. You should hope for the best, right? But like, expect the worst. Is that a better way to frame it? It just means that like, don't give up hope. You should always think and demand better standards, but realize the reality that you're living within and shield yourself <laughs> so that you don't get disappointed when your favorite anime gets you know, animated and it's just fucking garbage. But here's the link. Please go check Mr. Probably Pretentious out. Here it is.
Here's a link. Give it a like if you did, and I will see you next time.